Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Ongoing means I've been doing it for seven years now and will continue to do it. Um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu where you'll find all the previous ones organized in various ways. This show is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. Um, if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it to any amount, um, there's donate buttons on every page of the site. My guest today is a very interesting person. I'm very excited about this interview. It's Dr. Jude Kuravan. Um, she, I, I f just have been reading her book, um, The Cosmic Hologram, and um, in that book she sometimes refers to polymaths uh, in referring to some mathematician or something. And I would say that Jude is definitely a polymath, which means somebody who is extremely um, well-versed in a wide variety of uh, fields of knowledge. Um, she has a master's degree in um, quantum mechanics and cosmology from Oxford, um, a PhD in um, anthrop... was it? Archae anthropology, um, studying the archaeology. archaeology, studying the cosmology of ancient cultures. Um, she's a healer, a futurist, an astrologer. <laughs> she was previously one of the most senior businesswomen in the UK as CFO and executive board member of two major international companies. Um, so she's an extremely well-rounded person and she she swears that she's read all those books behind her and that's only one wall of the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's traveled to more than 70 countries, worked with wisdom keepers from many traditions and has been a lifelong researcher into the scientific and experimental understanding of the nature of reality. Um, she's written six books and The Cosmic Hologram to which I just referred is just her latest. So, she lives in Wiltshire, England, by the way. So, welcome, Jude. I'm really happy to be doing this with you. Rick, it's my pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, one of the reasons I'm excited about what Jude is doing is that, um, as you may know, if you've been watching this show, I, I, I get sort of turned on by the juxtaposition of science and spirituality. I, I think that they're kind of two legs of uh, of the human you know endeavor of, of gaining knowledge and you, you don't walk so well if you just use one of your legs um, I, I think they they each have something to offer the other to um, to enrich and deepen and make more objective and verifiable the other's field of endeavor and I, I have a feeling that in a few hundred years we really won't differentiate between them that we'll sort of regard um, you know the the human attempt to gain knowledge as one sort of unified thing which in which incorporates uh, what we now think of as science and spirituality but both will have evolved and grown tremendously by that time what do you think about that opening Jude I think it's a great opening Rick and I completely agree with it I mean all my life I've had that sense that there really isn't you know that it's a nonsense the schism between these two different ways of understanding the nature of reality I mean when we go back thousands of years you know what is often called the sacred science was exactly that it was trying to understand the nature of reality completely and science is a great tool but so is experiential understanding and, and, you know, and that deeper perspective of, of more than just the physical reality, but multidimensional realities, which of course is the, is the, is the journey of the seeker of truth through spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned that, that segues us right into a good starting place, um, which is that when you were four years old, you began to have multidimensional experiences. Uh, as I recall, you said that Thoth came to you, and as I looked it up, and Thoth is that Egyptian god that has the head of a bird. Um, so, did you actually perceive that being with the head of a bird, or did, was it more of a sort of a intuitive sense that, that that intelligence that was contacting you at that young age was Thoth? And how would you even have known who or what Thoth was at the age? <laughs> A very, a very good question. I didn't. Is the reality? He just said, I "Hi, never, I'm Thoth." 
us off. It took a while to say his name, but basically, you're right. And and I didn't understand this the way that the ancient Egyptians had perceived him until you know a little while later. You're right. For me, it was clairaudient. I heard a voice in my head. It was also clairsentient. Um, so I just felt his presence, but I was hearing this voice and, and I did see a discarnate light. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was four years old. What's not to feel natural about? Nobody was telling me it was nonsense. Nobody was telling me it was my imagination and it wasn't. So that beca began a lifelong journey of exploration. Um, that I'm still on, of course. But yeah, it was, I, and, and I wondered for ages why the Egyptians had depicted him like that. They also depicted him as a baboon. Hmm. Um, and the reason that apparently they depicted him as a baboon was that the baboons um, look at the sunrise as the sun rises, so looking straight into the sun, hmm. or at least that was the perception. So it's about clear sight, it's about seeing deeply, it's about understanding the nature of reality in all ways. Um, and he's been a, a mentor for me all my life. Hmm. So you've maintained a relationship with him? Very much. But you know, the other thing is that what we call the gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, the Egyptian word is netta, plural netera. And that's more like principles of consciousness or archetypal consciousness. Um, when we talk about gods and goddesses, we sort of lose an understanding of, of higher levels of, of archetypal intelligences of which he and many others um, form, you know, this multidimensional reality. Yeah, and same would be true of the gods and goddesses or whatever they call them in, in all the different cultures, ancient sure. cultures. And, it, it, and, you know, it's easier to sort of make them into cartoon characters almost and dismiss them as, the, you know, quaint imaginings of primitive cultures, but actually, well, I'll let you elaborate. What, what, what it points to is actually something very real and very deep. I completely agree. And my whole life I've, I've had these communications, not just with Thoth, but with many, many other multidimensional beings of various levels of awareness. And one of the things that I've always been incredibly grateful for is the information I've received from, from they've been able to validate. Mm -hmm. In other words, I've, I've accessed information that I wouldn't have accessed in other ways, and I've been able to verify that information. Mm. You know, I get flack even from fair, whom people I would consider fairly advanced spiritual seekers when I talk about this kind of stuff in interviews or, or talk to guests who talk about this kind of stuff, because there's a certain category of, of spiritual seekers who think that any of this sort of subtle reality business regarding you know subtle intelligences or beings or anything else is just so much maya you know it's 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 imaginary it has nothing to do with self-realization and it's a it's it's probably just un, totally unreal but even if there's reality to it it's it's a distraction we shouldn't bother with it we should go straight to the source and i just tend to have a more inclusive understanding or opinion of what f spiritual development entails. I think that um, it, it actually includes sort of the, a comprehensive appreciation of the whole range of reality, gross, subtle, and transcendent, and doesn't exclude any of it. That's exactly my perspective too, and it's been my lifelong journey of, of, of exploration and experiential awareness of all of this. And that's not to say that obviously we can expand our awareness fully into the numinosity of, of oneness, but I, you know, we're, if we're microcosmic co-creators of realities, there is an amazing abundance of multidimensional intelligences. You know, are we going to ignore all of that? Are we going to ignore all the wisdom of, 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 of the story of humanity so far? Are we going to, it just, it just seems to me a, a, um, a, a very, quite a narrow perspective to just go to source. Yes, of course, but encompass it all, as you say, inclusively, you know? Yeah, and actually what I was saying a few minutes ago about how you know, the human quest for knowledge might look in a few hundred years from now. Um, you know, mm -hmm. looking back, there actually were cultures um, wh in which 
um, communication with and um, co collaboration with absolutely these subtle intelligence was was kind of commonplace. Uh, they helped another one another. In fact, there's a verse in the in the Gita that you support the gods and they support you. There's this I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> That just gave me an itchy nose, actually. I'll just something so much. Well, the thought to the rescue here. <laughs> but you're right. It was seen, it was seen as a reciprocity. Right. Um, and, and, of course, many indigenous people still continue that perception. Um, and for me, too. I mean, it's been an enormously powerful, empowering, supportive, nurturing continuing presence in my life and as I say I've and as many many folks have you know to, to obtain information that I couldn't have discovered in any other way and it's been verified so it's not just imaginal it, it is it is verifiable information and deep insights deep insights for me at any rate of who I am as a person and what the world is like and it's a very beautiful and very all-encompassing perspective of the nature of reality. Mm. Now, when I hear something like, you know, this being comes to a four-year-old child, or to anyone of any age, but particularly, you know, a four-year-old child, I kind of get the feeling like, well, okay, they're, they're tagging you. They're, they're saying, you know, hey guys, we've got a live one here. Let's give her some juice. You know, this, this, person, <laughs> this person could actually be very instrumental and, and helpful in, in furthering planetary evolution. You know, let's kind of like give her our support and, and blessings and help her along. Yeah, I feel that. But, I, you know, the ability the, to, to, to engage multidimensionally is innate in who we are. You know, I'm not special in that regard. And, and, and you know, we all have those, uh, you know, I think we all have those, we all have those abilities. I suppose what was great for me is it was so early that it was natural. Yeah. And funnily enough, it never occurred to me to actually have a conversation about it with any of the folks around me. So I was never in that really difficult position of people saying, oh, it's just your imagination, forget it, or you're just dreaming, or what nonsense, stop it. So I was never closed down. I was never under pressure to, to, to you know, close my eyes and my ears to what I was experiencing. And that has been just an amazing gift. Yeah, that's good, and and you know there are many people I've talked to who had the opposite experience where they did start telling their parents or something, and were told they were just you know imagining things or, you know that sure. it's it's bad or you know whatever, and it, it sort of shut down. So are you are you kind of saying that throughout your sixty odd years of existence, this communication has continued, or was there a period where you lost it for a while and then rediscovered it? I think I mislaid it rather than lost it. Uh -huh. um, when I was in my mid twenties, I would say between my late twenties and my late thirties, I was I was in international business, as you mentioned in your introduction. Mm -hmm. I was traveling around the world. I was I was in a very materialistic phase of my journey, and and actually it was great because first of all I did so much traveling. I was working with many many different cultures and and peoples. I was practicing my ability to communicate across a very wide breadth of people, ability to multitask, ability to really ground myself, but it was very materialistic. And so all of the guidance and all of the, those communications were on the back burner for, I would say, those, those 10, 12 years. They were never gone, but and, and my intuition was still strong, mm -hmm. but I wasn't having the active daily involvement and communication that I was having up till then and, and I've had since. Yeah. So um, what are some of the more, we're going to obviously get into the whole th you know, th theme of your book and everything, but what are some of the more noteworthy um, f highlights of, of that communication that you've had? I mean, I'm sure there are hundreds you could recount, but um, you know, what, what really stands out in your memory as being significant milestones or downloads, you know, of, of information? Just to, to mention perhaps several, um, in the late 90s, um, I was going through a very, very challenging part of my life. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I'd left, I'd left international business. 
I very clearly being guided that it was the right time to do that, but it was an essential leap into the unknown. And um, at the time of the new millennium, or just before that, a couple of years before that, I got a major download of information about undertaking. I thought it was going to be 12 journeys. It ended up being 13 journeys around the world mm. to particular powerful spots to basically be a conduit for consciousness to come through and help activate the planetary grid for whatever shift of consciousness humanity was preparing for, is preparing for, is undergoing. And those ended up being something like six or seven years and the synchronicities and the guidance was was phenomenal and it was so funny because often I would literally arrive somewhere not knowing why so sort of turn around and then everything would unfold so I told the stories the true stories of those journeys in a book called the 13th step mm -hmm. which also was very much an inner journey as well as an outer journey because it deepened my own spiritual awareness it broadened my own um, ability to to communicate um, multidimensionally. So it was a very much a deep inner journey as well as this this pretty amazing outer journey of discovery. So that was one. Another one was when I was in um, Abydos. Do you know Abydos in Egypt? No. It's a place called the Assyrian and um, it's on it's very, very ancient. Um, Really, archaeologists don't know how ancient, and, and it's very difficult to fit it into their dynastic, you know, time frame. It's much more ancient than that. But I was there um, at the temple that's next to this. This is what is now underground ruins of a temple called the Assyrian. And at the temple of Seti the First, at the back of there, there are three small chapels, and one of them is dedicated to Osiris, uh, one of the Egyptian gods or Netra. And um, I asked for an initiation by Osiris, which um, was a pretty uh, interesting response I got. After I asked for that initiation, it was as though a veil had come over my eyes. I started to sob. I absolutely just racked by sobs. And I walked through the temple. I'd never been there before. Walked through the temple, go to the outside of the temple at the back. And I just knew the way, even though I'd not been there before and start to walk down in the, the sunshine to the Assyrian. At that time, you could actually walk down onto the, 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 the ground of the, uh, the Assyrian. And it was covered by about that much of water, so I could see where I was going. I sat down, pulled my jeans up, took two steps and fell into a 35 foot or more um, uh, 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 a well cave okay. well cover it filled with water mm -hmm. and as i'm going down and the water by this time is over my head i'm i'm not panicking i'm just realizing this is the initiation yeah. and this is it was initiation by water which was the ancient assyrian path the next moment after i thought this is the initiation i was sitting on the steps just absolutely wet through dripping wet having some way levitated out of that well. So well, that was pretty interesting. How about swimming out of it? I mean, was it just what, filled with water? Couldn't you just sort of it, dog paddle up? No, I was literally, it was about that wide. Mm -hmm. I was going down and I, I didn't dog paddle. I was literally going down on the moment that I was thinking this is the initiation of Osiris. And the next moment I was literally sitting on the steps. Oh, I have no recollection how I got Didn't you remember climbing out. out, yeah. No, no, I, I categorically hmm. not categorically not. And so what sort of change did you feel that that um, produced in you of, of a lasting nature? <laughs> well, you may have heard of something called a Kundalini experience. Sure. <laughs> all the time. Well, all <laughs> the time, all the time. Well, I literally, as I sat on the steps within about five minutes of sitting on those steps, I felt that I was on fire. Mm. And that, the whole Kundalini raised and that lasted Even though you were three soaking days. wet. <laughs> Even though I was soaking wet on the outside, yeah. I was on fire inside and that lasted three days. Mm -hmm. So it was... Uh, and then once that, once that, that subsided, okay. you know, how did you feel you had changed, you know, as compared with a week beforehand or something? My sentience was, was clearer. Uh, mm -hmm. My clairaudience was clearer, my clairsentience was clearer. I began to be clairvoyant mm -hmm. and I'd never been really clairvoyant before that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I sort of moved on to that clairvoyance after that. Okay. 
Now you're referring to siddhis, as it's called in Sanskrit, and um, there's, you know, some kind of ancient dispute or debate over over siddhis, whether they are a natural byproduct of higher consciousness, whether they are a stumbling block because they may be a distraction, whether uh, they're actually an aid to um, developing higher consciousness and so on. So where do you stand on that debate? I don't have a prescriptive answer to that. I, my sense is that, you know, I've heard of people having Kundalini experiences and, and having psychotic breakdowns as a result. Sure. Certainly the ancient teachings was that, you know, to be guided through these sort of processes by some form of, of teacher. Um, it happened that my teachers were pr primarily discarnate. <laughs> um, um, but, I, you know, I, I think it depends on the circumstances, the individual, and, and perhaps, you know, a karmic path. So I, I wouldn't like to be prescriptive. For me, it was incredibly opening. It just took me to a whole new level of, of my, my spiritual path and my spiritual awareness. Mm -hmm. And that journey um, literally opened the way because that actual, that initiation took place before I had the download that ended up being those 13 journeys that I spoke about a little earlier. And I don't know, and I'll, you know, I may or may not have had been able to um, accept that download without that particular experience pre-setting it. Yeah, like kind of prepared the ground for it or something. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, now, you know, in spiritual circles, people talk a lot about self-realization or enlightenment or, you know, a kind of a shift to... Uh, the incorporation of uh, sort of universal, unbounded, even impersonal consciousness into one's living experience. Um, and there are all sorts of verses in the Upanishads which say things like, you know, thou art that, you are that universal consciousness, all of this is that, and so on. And, um, you know, in light of the sort of the immensity of, of that realization, again, sometimes people belittle you know, various, you know, cities or psychic abilities or clear audience and so on, they, they say, well, it's just, that's just a, such a small thing compared to self-realization. Don't get hung up in that. So, um, you know, what, what is your experience with regard to that sort of shift? Um, it, you know, has, has some, ha, ha, was there a watershed moment for you where you shifted into something like that or not yet or, or what? It wasn't a watershed moment, but there were many watershed moments. Mm -hmm. And whilst I certainly do not belittle that what I call supernormal attributes, because we all have them and right. we can all, um, you know, learn from and expand our awareness in doing them. I, I do have great sympathy for not getting distracted by them or not mm -hmm. stopping there. So for me, it's an and and, you know, it is that and, and certainly those outer and inner journeys that that are ongoing for me, mm -hmm. uh, are very much that process of, of progressive enlightenment and understanding it, experiencing and embodying the unity awareness of, of unified reality. Mm. Yeah, embodying is an important term these days. <laughs> a lot of people are using it, you know, because a lot of people either intellectually or experientially, um, you know, were focused on some sort of self-realization or you, you know impersonal realization and then they found out after a while of focusing on that that hey wait a minute i still have a life you know <laughs> i have i have relationships actually, uh, yeah i have relationships i have financial concerns exactly. and so and so then the whole concern became how to embody this deeper dimension with regular life exactly and now i feel very, very important. You know, it, I, I, many years ago when I was doing my PhD in archaeology, and it was very anthropological as well, so I can understand why is it off. It's called phenomenology. It's a, it's a, a type of archaeology that does recognize the experiential um, evidence uh, that points to understanding ancient cultures, not just through their artifacts, but through many th many other things. But I was doing some what's called field walking uh, near my home um, at Avebury, about 10 minutes away from where we live. And it was a gorgeous morning, a bright blue sky, no body around, but out of the blue sky came these words, in the commonality of our humanity, we're all ordinary. In the 
reality of our divinity were all extraordinary. Mm. And it was such, for me, it was such a, a aha moment because it's, yes, it's, it's actually experienced the ordinary in the extraordinary and the extraordinary in the ordinary and embodying that on, on a daily level. And for me, that is what enlightenment is about. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it's, there's, there's something, well, I won't even elaborate. That's, you, you made the point very well. Um, well, just to throw in something, I mean, it, enlightenment has this sort of connotation or has had in some people's minds of being this extraordinary, special, super duper thing that, you know, you had to be some kind of a spiritual superman to attain, you know, some, somebody like the Buddha or Ramana Maharshi or something. And one of the main themes of my show, in fact, the subtitle of this show is Conversations with Ordinary Spiritually Awakening People. And I, I made it awakening rather than awakened. In fact, it, originally it was awakened and we changed it because I, I just became more and more convinced that no one's finished, you know. Um, it, we're, <laughs> we're all a work in progress, no matter how highly evolved we may be. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. And, and, you know, my discarnate teachers, not just Thoth, but, the, you know, that's that's what I've heard all my life. You know, this is our, our universe, our universe the soul, you know, a finite thought form in the in the infinity of the cosmos is evolving. Yeah. It's you know, it we are all learning, we're all moving, we're all, you know, so yes, work in progress. I would guess that your teachers, Thoth and, and the rest, are, are would cop to that too, that you know, we're evolving and the whole universe is evolving, everything in it yes. is evolving. Which is not to say yes. that there isn't a level of reality which doesn't evolve, which is sort of like eternal and changing and all that but as far sure. as far as actually living and reflecting that expressing that could there be any end to that development i don't know because we haven't reached there yet right. yeah. <laughs> i i suspect i mean i suspect not i mean certainly what i write about in the cosmic hologram mm -hmm. is the cosmological um, evidence that's that's definitely moving more and more to this perspective that ours and in fact all universes are finite mm -hmm. constructions of consciousness in which that is a, a an evolutionary process of learning experiencing exploring evolving emergent um within an infinite eternal cosmic plenum so you know what does an end point comprise when ultimately there is no end point mm. And what would be the point of an end point? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like God would say, okay, now what am I going to do? <laughs> exactly. If, 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 if it all began because God got bored, I can't see that going back to nothing is going to, you know, help anything. It's just continuing to express and explore. Yeah. So let's shift a little bit to the cosmic hologram. Um, where would you like to start with this? I have like four pages of notes, but... Um, you know, maybe give us a synopsis of what the book is about. Well, basically, the book is about moving, be is, is basically bringing the latest scientific evidence across many, many fields of endeavor that's showing that um, it's in not energy, matter, or space-time, that's the most fundamental attribute of physical reality. So information, not random data, but patterned information is more fundamental than energy and matter and space-time. And is, is really, as a result, taking us beyond appearance of duality, appearance of, of materiality, um, into recognition as the ancient spiritual uh, understanding and, and all spiritual understanding is that reality is essentially unified. It plays out on many, many different levels, but it is essentially unified. So it's not that mind arises from matter. Mind is matter. Matter is mind. Information is reality. And ultimately, consciousness isn't something we have. It's what we and the whole world are. But the book doesn't begin there. It shows all the evidence of how our universe is and progressively leads to a perspective where the scientific evidence is pointing to that this is this is the case. This is the deeper um, fundamental nature of, of all that we call reality. Mm -hmm. 
Now, usually when you think, when you hear the word information, you think of maybe a newspaper, you know, which actually still exists, um, where you, you have <laughs> you have you know words, and that that conveys information. Or you think of a computer, and information is encoded in in you know bits and bytes and uh, binary code or whatever. And um, so, if you're saying that information is sort of this fundamental reality, more fundamental than space and time. Um, what is, how is that information encoded? What is the nature of it? What is the content of it? Well, first of all, just to take perhaps a step back, physicists have known for a very long time just how truly ephemeral physical reality is. I mean, when we drill down to subatomic levels, all that we call whatever, however solid it appears to be, everything is something like 99.999999999999% no thingness and subatomic entities themselves at the tiniest are excitations they're not tiny billiard balls they are excitations in in a field of of what is now being understood is an informational field rather than anything we've previously termed physical yeah. the other so thing so even the physical convert- things aren't physical no. Right. I mean, we're really having to restate our understanding of what we understand by physical. The only reason, you know, you can sit on a chair, I can stand on a, on a floor, is the way that the, those excitations relate to each other means they can't occupy the same position, the same quantum right. state. The poly um, exclusion principle, right? I learned exa- that from your book. Ex- <laughs> Excellent, excellent. <laughs> but yeah, exactly that. And and it's it's just very straightforward. If they were if they were able to align, they would move through each other, and you wouldn't be sitting on the chair, and I mm. wouldn't be standing on the floor. But that is an appearance. It is not the fundamental nature of reality. The other thing that's been shown now, and again, I talk about it in the book is that information, the same bits of information that are allowing us to have this conversation over Skype, that are, you know, the workings of our computers that make up how we create holograms and our virtual realities, those digitized bits of ones and zeros, those digitized information is exactly, exactly the same as the universal information that makes up physical reality and has been shown most recently in experiments to be as physically real as any subatomic entity. So what physicists are beginning to understand is the need to restate the laws of physics as algorithms. You know, we we write algorithms instructing our computer programs how to operate. Well, the laws of physics are really the algorithms allowing our universe to exist and evolve. So who wrote the algorithms and in what are the algorithms encoded? Um, you know, in, in our computers, we could look at the actual code of the algorithms and somebody actually wrote it. So how, would, how does that work for the universe itself? Well, for the universe, the algorithms are really mathematical. So they're relational. So for example, when Newton, three, 400 years ago, said F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, that is an algorithm and that explains how forces throughout our entire universe when they're applied to a mass create an acceleration so it's just it's a very simple algorithm say if you apply this to that then that happens so it's it's relational all of the equations of uh, the laws of physics are algorithms. If you actually look and see how somebody writes computer code, it add this to that and produce that. Multiply this by that and see uh, to the outcome. So all the laws of physics, the equations of physics, are the relational algorithms, which are just moving the information that's expressed as energy matter around whether it's in a body, whether it's in a planet, whether it's in a star, whether it's throughout our entire universe. So if the universe conforms to mathematics or or operates by virtue of mathematical algorithms that humans can understand, then it's almost like mathematics is the language of nature which we've able we've been able to sort of um, interpret or and, and you know codify in our own 
with our own sim with our own symbols, but it's not like something we invented. It's more like something we discovered. I completely agree. I mean, another species living on a planet at the other side of the galaxy, if they've got to our level of, of self-awareness and experiment, will have come up with F equals MA. Mm -hmm. They'll have come up with an E equals H nu. They'll have come up with these equations. They may obviously be using different symbols, mm -hmm. but equal equals, multiply, multiply, add, add, divide, divide. These are the relationships that apply throughout our universe and any species getting to the level of, of, of self-awareness that actually has, I mean, you know, has the ability to, 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 to do what we do will have discovered the same mathematical underpinnings mm -hmm. uh, that are the, the algorithms of, of, of universal existence and evolution. And that's one of the fundamental principles of science, isn't it? That um, the laws of nature are universal. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the evidence that our universe is finite and undertakes a finite cycle from its birth 13.8 billion years ago, what I call the big breath rather mm -hmm. than the big bang, because it wasn't explosive. It wasn't random. It was incredibly fine tuned, incredibly ordered um, through to its end point. And, and you know, the, 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 the laws of physics such as they are, are exactly as you say, they, they are universally applicable wherever we are in the universe, whenever we are in the universe. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, the Vedic perspective concurs with that. And they, they, I think they even might use the, the metaphor of breathing. Uh, but they also re recognize an in-breath as well as an out-breath. And, and just as we breathe, the, the, the universe sort of breathes in and out, or maybe multiple universes do, and it's this eternal cycle my sense is that at the moment, the, the evidence suggests, the physical, the physical laws of our universe suggest it's a simple, what's called an adiabatic cycle from minimum informational entropy to highest informational entropy. What happens then is very speculative because we don't have the understanding from a physical viewpoint of to what might happen then there are a couple of there are a couple of theories that I'd write about in the book mm -hmm. um, so there may be an in breath but the in breath may be almost the cosmic plenum absorbing what our universe has evolved to so it may be an in breath in a, of a different way mm -hmm. but I agree with you the Vedas have profound insights profound wisdom for us mm. one of the things they say is that when creation goes back into um, the big sleep, I forget what they call it, but you know, that um, all the souls existing at that time sort of go into this, this you know, um, wh what would be the word, this, this sort of um, resting state or something. And then when the next creation comes out, the very same souls come out and continue on in, in their evolution, picking up from where they left off. That may well be the case. And actually, that is that is very close to what leading edge science is, is coming to view. The big sleep is, is what I'd describe in the book, is what happens when that minimum um, informational entropy has evolved to the maximum entropy able to be held within our universe, rather like a bubble, very simply, rather like a bubble growing and growing and then bursting. Mm -hmm. When our universal bubble bursts, is that the dissipation back into the, the sleep? that the Vedas talk about into the infinite cosmic plenum, waiting for the next bubble to come forward <laughs> hey, and go on where they left off. Let's define entropy since some people might not be uh, familiar with the term. Okay, well, let's go back to Ludwig Boltzmann, who was the scientist, the Austrian scientist who studied the what's called the thermodynamics of gases, the way gases behave. So it, it's attributes of heat, temperature, work, etc. And he came up with effectively two main laws of thermodynamics. The first one's to do with conservation of energy and matter in a closed system, but the second one is to do with this, this concept of entropy. Now, he was studying gases, so he was studying, he was doing this before 
even atoms had been discovered. He predicted atoms, but they hadn't yet been experimentally proven. But what he was basically saying is that the entropy of a system describes its number of microstates, the number of states it can take. So think about this um, in a different way. Think of it perhaps as a pack of cards. If you have a pack of cards, you take the cellophane wrapping off and they come out very clean and crisp and ordered. They're ordered in their suits, yeah? So there's the, the, that is a low entropy because they're very ordered. There are very few microstates in that system. You throw them up in the air, they go everywhere. You collect them, they're not going to be in the same order that they came out of the pack. They have more microstates. You throw them up again and they're even more in from, you know, microstates. So what you get is, is an inevitable increase from a low level of entropy to a higher level of entropy, a lower number of states to a high number of states. Now, for a long time, people have sort of described that as order and disorder, but actually it really isn't, or at least that, that can be misleading. It's more that it's from simplicity to complexity. And when you redefine uh, entropy in informational terms, and we can do that because the same equation that Ludwig Boltzmann came up with 150 or more years ago, which is the entropy of system equals a constant named after him, Boltzmann's constant, times the logarithm of these number of microstates. 50 or 60 years ago, an IBM engineer called Claude Shannon came up with exactly the same equation, but this time to describe the information of a system. Now, since Shannon's time, other informational scientists have come to the appreciation that what it actually is showing is the informational content of a system. So what you have is instead of thermodynamic entropy, as the number of microstates always increasing, you have informational entropy also increasing. And this time we can go back to the origin of our universe and show that entropy was at its lowest at the first moment and has been increasing ever since. Now what that does, it gives the time its arrow, but it also shows that it's the informational content of our universe that is ever increasing. So when we look at entropy in informational terms, that gives us an understanding of how our universe evolves because more, there was less informational entropy in our universe yesterday than there is today, than there will be tomorrow, than there will be the day after. Because our universe in its entirety, not just you and I and our beautiful planet and our solar system, everything, our entire universe both exists and evolves as a unified entity. And it's the informational entropy that is its measure of evolutionary progress from simplicity to complexity. But it's not that space itself is getting more complex. It's that the informational entropy is being more and more individuated from hydrogen into stars, into planets, into biological organisms such as ourselves. Well, it seems to me that that's the opposite of entropy. Let me, let me elaborate for a moment. Um, I mean, let's, tell you, let's say you take a Volkswagen, a new Volkswagen, and you put it out in, in a field, and you come back 100 years later, and you find a pile of rust. All right, so entropy has done its thing, and um, you know what was a very sort of ordered, you know, th thing with specific parts fitting in specific ways has just become this sort of, it's, it's broken down to its more fundamental components. Same would be true of a human body, you know, L let it decompose, and you've got primarily about four elements with a bunch of other ones in smaller proportions. So, sure. And I think it was Ilya Prigogine who who spoke of. Um, biological life as eating negative entropy, that you somehow take in orderliness from the environment and, and incorporate it into your structure and, and maintain and actually evolve greater complexity and orderliness despite the entropic influences, you know, bombarding you. Um, so when you say that increasing entropy equates with increasing information, I don't totally understand that. I feel like there's there's okay. sort of a loss of information. No, there isn't. Um, um, but basically, I mean, Ilya Prigogine was a genius, but what he didn't 
take account of is the finite closed um, universe. What I'm talking about is our entire universe okay. is always increasing entropy. And therefore, to actually separate the information of, say, an organism or a Volkswagen from the environment, you can't do it. That's the point. Our universe is fundamentally interconnected. So the, 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 the Volkswagen itself, the energy matter of that Volkswagen, reduces to its metals and all the rest of it. But that information is still part of our universal structure, our universe or universe souls uh, continuing um, evolutionary process that is entropic of itself. So you, you, it, the, the problem you have is when you try and dig it into just one bit, so a person, a Volkswagen, a planet, you have to look at the entire universe as, as a unified entity in this regard. And the information is not then lost. It's actually uh, from the holographic principle held on the two-dimensional holographic boundary of what appears three-dimensional space mm. but actually all of the all of the cosmological um, theories that are moving forward are moving in the same direction of suggesting this holographic principle is fundamental to the way our universe exists and evolves okay let's get on to holographs in a moment um, but just to pursue this a bit more um, so Okay, fine. So entropy as a whole and throughout the entire universe is increasing, uh, but it would seem that any sort of uh, arisal of, of specificity of, of, you know, of a planet, of a fern, of a dinosaur, of a human being, it, it sort of bucks the overall trend that there's this sort of, um, you know, increase of decrease of entropy and increase of orderliness and and specificity within a particular expression no, no, within no. the universe no 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 because order <laughs> <laughs> no essentially not what it does though it, it, you're right about the specificity what happens is the universe as a whole is increasing its entropy yeah. with it on a planet there is increasing entropy because um, increased entropy is more information Order is the lowest entropy. Disorder is, oh, that's why I don't like using order, disorder. It's simplicity, complexity. That is the, that is the direction that entropy takes, that information takes. It's simplicity to complexity, but you have to look at it as a whole universe because otherwise you get into this syntropy, negentropy cycle, which is not helpful because it's still separating um, units from environments from other units unit. We need to look at the whole of our universe and understand that the entirety of our universe is evolving. And we are its microcosmic co-creative representations of that. Just as we, we you know, have evolved from being a baby to, a, to a, 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 an adult, even when we, when we, our bodies move, the information of our consciousness continues. Yeah. You mean like reincarnation kind of thing, where the information that yeah. we, we accrue in one life is carried into the next? Essentially, yes, but on a much bigger scale than that, because if, if you, going back to the holographic principle and perceiving, go back to the bubble idea of our universe sort of being blown up from its very tiny origins, mm -hmm. blown up as a bubble, that surface of that bubble is where all the information is held, which is why space has to expand and time to flow for our universe to evolve. Because more and more information is held on that surface brain, as it's called, which then appears as experience, as evolutionary processes within what we call space time. Okay, so um, you know, you're sitting in front of a bookshelf, and there's a lot of information mm -hmm. on that bookshelf. And um, are you saying that? The, all, all the information of the universe is encoded in the bubble, the outer shell of the universe. Would, would that, uh, do you mean that literally to, uh, to say, for instance, that all the information in the books behind you is, is somehow in that shell uh, of the universe? That's, that's the kind yeah. of thing? Okay. And that's what cosmologists are pointing to. All of the, all of the uh, various theories are converging on that what we call three-dimensional space is actually a holographic projection. 
from that surface area, from that surface brain. And um, let's, let's do this from time to time. I mean, there might be some people who are just sort of, personally, I love talking about this kind of thing and reading your book and all, because it stretches me. I, I sort of hang on for dear life while I'm reading your book, thing, <laughs> trying to understand what you're saying. And, and I feel like it gets more neurons firing to do that, rather than just sort of reading a Louis L'Amour novel or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so people who might be feeling a little challenged by this discussion, just hang in there and think of questions you might want to ask, however simple, to, to help clarify your understanding of this. And I, I do feel it, it, it is relevant to the whole spiritual enlightenment thing. It, understanding the, the way the universe works is, is somehow relevant to our personal realization. I feel. Um, and maybe you could elaborate on why that is the case, just as a little interlude here. I, I absolutely agree with you, Rick. I mean, if, if what we're saying is that within an infinite, eternal, cosmic mind, our universe, our universe soul, is a finite thought form that has a beginning and evolves and experiences and will have an end, we have incarnated as individuated microcosms of that intelligence to play our part, mm -hmm. to help to, you know, to, to, to experience and, and to play our part potentially in that evolution. So my sense is, my feeling this is incredibly empowering uh, because the other thing it does is to show us that, you know, the duality material duality perspective that you and I are separate, that we're separate from our beautifully beautiful planetary home, that you know everything is random and meaningless is nonsense. That is just isn't the way that reality is. So for me as a healer, I know that if somebody has misplaced beliefs or fragmented perspectives, those beliefs will drive their behaviors. So on a collective level, it seems to me that our fragmented perspectives have driven our dysfunctional behaviors. So we pollute our planet, we're causing environmental mayhem, we fight and kill each other, all really coming from this duality-based perception, which of itself is, is, is wrong. So if we can heal our fragmented perspectives into what I'm calling the whole world view, then perhaps that will play its part in helping us heal our behaviors. Yeah, well, that's a great point. Um, you, you um, I, I mentioned to you before the interview with my friend Robin, who is a mathematician. He and I spent about two and a half hours yesterday afternoon talking about your book and just pontificating about various things, the two of us, you know, just sort of speculating and discussing <laughs> and all. And one conclusion we came through to is that, um, you know, Robin sort of drew this graph with his, with his hands where, you know, science is here in the middle and there's a whole bunch of stuff in different directions that science completely loses the ability to deal with. I mean, even such things okay. as, as emotions or economy or things like that, it's just out of science's league. And when we start talking about, you know, uh, otherworldly beings or, you know, even what dark matter is, um, which should be within the domain of science, science is mute. They don't know what it is, but they're working and trying to figure it out. Um, but I think that the reason I'm mentioning this is that it's, it's good to have a certain humility, I think, um, with regard to what we know and what we're, what we're able to know at this point and to keep an open mind. Uh, and there's so many in the scientific community who don't do that, you know, who just say it's only this or that's woo woo or, Agreed. you know, who just sort of brush off even somebody like you who, who are talking about things that are outside of their current understanding. And, you know, the history of science is rife with this sort of thing. And I don't I forget who it was, but someone sure. someone said that science progresses through a series of funerals because usually somebody, you know, has to die and a new generation has to come in before new ideas are adopted. But it, but, you know, I don't know if we ha we can afford the luxury at this time in, in our history to go through generations before we really upgrade our understanding of of nature and of, of the way world work, the world works and of how intimately we're all interconnected, not only we humans, but w with all other species and with the planet itself. Our, our very existence depends upon a major upgrade happening soon. 
I completely agree. I think it was Thomas Kuhn actually who wrote a book called, on who coined the term paradigm shift. Right. And, uh, and and that's exactly right. And, and you know, I wrote this book not because it's an end point, but it's a direction of travel across all levels of science, all scales of research, all different um, areas and fields of research. And you're right. I mean. Uh, it is a work in pro all of this, everything is a work in progress. Enlightenment is a work in progress, as you said earlier. But I think that this is too important to keep to the scientists because you're right, science, for good or ill, for good or ill, science tends to, or scientific perspectives, tends to drive our collective viewpoint. And if science says that everything is just materialistic, follows a reductionist path, is random, um, everything is separate, then you know that doesn't just feel in, feed into science. It feeds into all our education. It feeds into our healthcare. It feeds into our economics. It feeds into everything. Yeah. So, and it, and if it's wrong, if it's wrong, and I believe no, not just believe the evidence, because it's not about belief. What I wanted to show in the book was the evidence and people can make their own minds up. But the evidence is so broad and convergent that, you know, our, our perspective of the world do, is, is about to transform and desperate needs to transform. Because you're right, we can't afford to go on as we have gone with these dysfunctional beliefs driving our dysfunctional behaviors. Yeah. Ronald Reagan had an interior secretary named James Watt who uh, was noted for one thing for uh, canceling the Beach Boys performance uh, on the 4th of July on the Capitol Mall because he thought they were too decadent or something. So, so they ended up with Wayne Newton who's this La Las Vegas lounge lizard. Uh, but <laughs> but that's not the point I want to make. His, his contribution to uh, the climate situation or the environmental situation, which was his purview as Interior Secretary, was to say let's just sort of extract all the resources as quickly as possible because Jesus is coming soon and we're not going to be around anyway, so let's just kind of rape the planet and be done with it. Uh, but that, I'm just bringing that up as an example of how it's kind of important to have a, a, a deeper, more holistic understanding of the way things work because it, it translates into policies which have very real impact on people. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we're seeing, we're seeing that with the Trump administration pulling out of the, pl uh, the Paris, Paris Climate Accord, Agreement. Yeah. And we're seeing it in terms of, you know, um, a man who was suing the EPA actually now head of the EPA yeah. and gutting it. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. And when we have these, and, and to be fair, you know, it's not just the scientism, it's also religious perspectives that have a, 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 an adverse effect on how we look after ourselves, how we look after our planetary home. Yeah. All right. So that little interlude was all about the importance of knowledge and, and correct knowledge or, you know, knowledge that actually correlates with reality in, uh, in, in terms of its impact on our personal lives, I would say, and also our society. I mean, it makes it, it uh, uh, Marsha Mahesh Yogi used to say that, that there are two, two legs to progress. One is intellectual understanding and the other is direct experience. And that one without, with, with one without the other can go, can go way off track. You know? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely agree with you. And I think the other thing is that, you know, um, someone was said you're entitled to your own opinions but not to your own facts. Right. So, you know, I know in the in the in the current situation good knows what's going on. Yeah. But what I try to do in the book is to is to be as factual as I can be, to be as evidentially based as I can be, and then people can can go through that journey and make their own views of this. Yeah. But ultimately I completely agree with you. It's both under standing on the intellectual level, but it's also experiencing um, uh, to, and bring those two together. And, and then embodying, embodying, because what do we do in the world? You know, a friend of mine is Gordon Devrin and he talks about head and heart and hands. And this is the first book of a trilogy and it's to understand the nature of unified reality. The second book that I'm just beginning to write is called Gaia Her Story, mm. which is about the experiential awareness of that um, and, and especially our relationship with Gaia, uh, our Mother Earth. And then the third book, and that's the heart, the third book is called Many Voices, One Heart, but it's the hands, it's our story of humanity. 
because when we understand unified reality, when we begin to experience unity awareness, what then? How do we embody? What do we do about it? What changes? And my sense of it, everything changes. It's like going into a dark room where you think you're alone, you're scared of the dark, you're scared of who else is out there, and you turn on the light and you realize all there is in the room, all there are in the room are friends. Hmm. What do you do? What do you do about it then? That's great. Well, let's have further conversations when those come out. Um, so holograms, the, the title of your book is about holograms. Um, what's a hologram? Why is that important to, to make as a very you know, th center, central theme of your book? How does it relate to the way the universe functions and, and how does that all tie back to our to any practical significance for us as human beings and particularly as human beings who are interested in spiritual enlightenment? I love your questions. and They're inevitably about a million parts to answer, so thank you. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, you asked about what's a hologram, essentially. Um, when we look at an object, we are, our eyes are receiving information about that object that's held within the light that's reflected off that object, which is why we can't see in the dark. You know, there is no light available to bounce off objects around us to be received and to see them. Mm -hmm. A hologram is, is happens when you actually shine a light on an object. So you're, you're, you shine a light on an object, you, you actually split the beam into two. One beam just goes straight on. The other beam is actually reflected off the object. It's a laser and light you're does, shining on it. It's a laser light. In our technologies currently, it's a laser light. Right. But what it's doing is it's picking up information about that object. It's bathing that object, whatever it may be, uh, in, in, in that light. And it's taking a, an analysis of its three-dimensional appearance, mm -hmm. all the information about its three-dimensional appearance. That light then goes back and, and, and joins the, 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 the split beam. And then they're, uh, they, they're shone on a two-dimensional uh, photographic frame of some sort. Okay, and they form a wiggly pattern like you see on an oil slick in a puddle. They create this pattern of waves and those waves, that pattern holds all the information on a two dimensional surface that's been picked up by this from this three dimensional object. When you now shine another light through that two dimensional um, film, the three dimensional object is then projected, or the appearance of the three-dimensional object is projected as a hologram. Sure, like so R2-D2 projecting Princess Leia in the first Star Wars Absolutely. Episode. Yeah. And you know, you go about 30 odd years to that, which I loved, and you look at how far our holography has come forward. And the reason for that is that the pixelation, the, the, the tiny little data points that can pick up um, the, the information from an object has got smaller and smaller, and more high and high definition. So holograms have got much more sophisticated. But the best pixelation we have for our current holograms are a hundred trillion trillion times bigger than the holographic pixelation of space time. Hundred trillion trillion times smaller. You mean no? No. Oh, bigger. No. I, bigger. Space the pixels are bigger. That's right. The pixels are bigger. Yeah. The information is less. No, 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 no. Think about a hologram and the pixelation I've just described. Right. Okay. So, you, okay. Now, take the principle of a hologram to our entire universe. And this mm -hmm. began when folks were looking at black holes. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to understand what happens to all the information that describes a star when a star contracts beyond an event horizon as a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, is the information lost? Well, if the information is lost, then quantum physics is in deep, deep trouble because quantum physics says that information cannot be lost in that way. And yet, so where does it go? So to cut a long story short, the, the analysis has been showing that it actually remains on two-dimensional surface area of that black hole, of that event horizon, mm -hmm. okay? Just as I talked about, you know, for the bubble, and the information on the surface area of the bubble. Think of that then to our whole universe. So that's called the holographic principle. So the idea is that our entire universe 
is a holographic projection of what we think of and experience as space time, but a holographic projection from the holographic boundary of space and time. Now, the point is, whereas the pixelation of our human columns is has become much more sophisticated, nonetheless, it doesn't even begin to approach this tiny, tiny scale of the pixelation of space-time. And that tiny scale is something called the Planck scale. Mm -hmm. Now, the Planck scale comes about when we throw all the forces of nature together and a certain units come out. And, and again, these would be the same units in different symbols whether we're on this planet or on a planet a million light years away, nonetheless, this comes out as a fundamental scale for the energy and matter and space and time of our universe. And on a spatial level, it's about 10 to the minus 35 meters, which when you consider that the nucleus of an atom is about 10 to the minus 15 meters, that's 20 orders of magnitude smaller than a proton in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So that's the level of the pixelation, tiny little Planck scale areas holding one bit of information for each Planck scale area. And that is a hundred trillion trillion times smaller than the pixelation we've managed to get in our man-made, human-made woman-made holograms. Right, so it's very, very high resolution, you could say, to use that kind of a term. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, the, rev it's the resolution of space-time. Mm -hmm. It's the resolution of the existence and the evolution of our universe as, as um, a, a universe soul, as, as a finite thought form in the mind of the cosmos. So are you saying that, um, you know, just as you could have a hologram of an apple and shine a laser through the holographic film and see an apple and so on, um, that everything we see around us, the room we're in, the people we're interacting with and so on, are holographic projections of information that is encoded at the Planck scale? Yes. And essentially that it is consciousness. You know, the consciousness, the intelligence in our universe, everything is consciousness. Consciousness isn't something we have. It's what we and the whole world are. So this is a this is a way by which consciousness, cosmic consciousness, has co-created a playground, an experiential perspective uh, that that we call our universe. That here on this level we call the physical realm. And the beauty of a hologram, a, a, a human-made hologram, is if you take that hologram of an apple or whatever object it is and you cut it and slice it, every pixelation encodes the whole. And again, that reflects ancient wisdom. Of but the, but of you, the lose, one you lose resolution when you do that. You lose resolution. Yeah. You lose resolution, yeah. yeah. But essentially, a hologram is innately unified and coherent. Yeah. And our universe is innately unified and coherent in that respect. Yeah. Um... So a couple of interesting points here come to mind. One is that we were talking a little while ago about mathematics being the language of nature and the, the human facility with mathematics is more of a, a sort of a, a cognition of what the system nature actually uses than it is a human invention. But a, a second point here would be that it seems like holography is the way nature, that, that God projects a, a yes. apparently 3D universe. Yes, and, and you know, you asked part of your earlier question was what relevance is it to us? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the chapters in the book is, is a chapter called Holographic Behaviors mm. because we find the signatures of the cosmic hologram. We find this sort of relational and scaling up and scaling down, which is also a, a fundamental attribute of holograms. We find that not just throughout nature, we find it throughout our human behaviors. So what Com what scientists studying complex systems, whether they be ecosystems or economic structures or galactic filaments or atomic transitions or the growth cities or whatever, are showing that the, the fractal patternings 
which are sort of geometric relational patternings underpin all that we call physical reality. And those themselves are by their nature holographic. So we're finding the signature of the cosmic hologram at every scale throughout our universe and not just through natural systems, but through human systems. So for example, the analysis that's been done of the way that the nodes within the internet work, you know, the connections, the relationships between web pages and, and, and how the internet works has exactly the same fractal and holographic structuring as do biological ecosystems. Hmm. When the analysis was done by two Harvard uh, astrophysicists, Henry Lin and, and Abraham Loeb recently, it was shown that if you take population densities as, a, as, as the key factor, um, the way that cities grow using the population densities of people as its factor and the way galaxies form using the population density of stars as its factor, they grow in exactly the same way. If you look at, for example, um, the analysis of earthquakes, which was many folks have done, but a couple of the earlier uh, earliest researchers were Gutenberg and Richter. They came up with an understanding that if you look at all earthquakes of whatever scale and then graph them against their frequency so that you have the size, the destructive power of earthquakes logarithmically and their frequency and you plot that you get a straight line. Actually, it's that way. You get a straight line. So what that shows is there's no such thing as an average earthquake. All there is is a relationship between the scale of an earthquake, and we call it the Richter scale, and its frequency. So an earthquake that is twice as powerful logarithmically on the Richter scale is four times less likely to occur which makes it very, very difficult to predict specific earthquakes because they all come along this line and they have this relationship between destructive power and frequency, but there's no average earthquake. Now, what's crucial, and I think a real aha, is that the same analysis has been done of, of human conflicts just after the Second World War. Um, Lewis Richardson, a researcher, analyzed hundreds of conflicts from the two world wars down to tiny or sort of regional wars and, and, and conflicts. And he plotted them in terms of their destructive capacities of number of human deaths against their frequency. And he came up with exactly the same relationship as for earthquakes. And more recently, um, uh, a, a team at the University of Miami has looked at insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan and have come to exactly the same analysis. Now that's showing us that the holographic behavior of earthquakes and the holographic nature of human conflicts follow the same patterning, the same relational patterning. And so what's the takeaway from this? Um, how can we benefit from this understanding? What, what can it do for us as a society? Okay. Well, first of all, it's, it's showing that we cannot continue to think of ourselves as somehow separate, that what I do to you doesn't affect me. Yeah, or no. what you do to me doesn't affect you. What it shows our universe is innately and fundamentally interconnected, that it literally, not metaphorically, but literally exists, evolves as a unified and coherent entity. The second thing is that this plays out on every scale, including. <laughs> Continue. Of analysis I, that muted, I, talk I, about I muted book. myself so people aren't going to know I sneezed and they're not going to know why you said bless you. But anyway, I just sneezed. Continue. <laughs> and, you know, people have studied everything from how people, you know, how we, we uh, use our mobile phones. There was, a ten, there was a, an analysis done of 10,000 anonymized mobile phone users, right? Everybody has different lifestyles. Everybody's going to work at different times. You know, choosing to use mobile or cell phones in different ways at different times. They're able to show that it was exactly the same holographic patterning 
that would be the case for non-human systems, which is why people like Google and Yahoo pay fortunes because it gives them predictive power by understanding these relationships, these holographic signatures, these fractal signatures of the cosmic hologram to predict our behaviors, which means that prediction might be helpful, but what if it moves to control? That may not be so helpful. Right. We need to understand this because, you know, we this is both empowering but potentially challenging and potentially, uh, not that this understanding's dangerous, but if we don't understand it, we could sleepwalk into um, you know, forces that we wouldn't want to have greater control on our lives, having that greater control. Oh, because well, a lot we of are them already do. I mean, they do. there's they all do. sorts of data I analysis mean. by you know, Facebook and Google and so on that makes them more effective at getting you to you know, buy the thing or, you know, or, you know, press the button or, you know, spend, you know, sure. they know how to manipulate your attention and get your eyeballs on the screen as much as possible. Yes, they do. And a lot of that is understanding the, 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 the sort of fractal holographic patternings that underpin, as I said, our behaviors. But the other thing is what this also shows is that we, each and every one of us, our microcosmic co-creators, part of the book I talk about is what I call supernormal phenomena that we all have abilities within, such as um, such as t telepathic, such as uh, um, levels of precognition, such as clairsentience, clairaudience, etc., which, you know, d would not reduce our humanity, but actually enhance it in that regard. But also, we have far more power, you know, our, our thoughts do affect not just our emotions, but our bodies. And I show evidence of, of experiments that have shown how monks and priests and nuns can, by thought alone, control bodies. Hypnosis. Yeah, you know, there are many, many ways in which our thoughts, our beliefs can affect our realities. So we need to understand this too, because otherwise we're sleepwalking into all sorts of issues. But for me, the deepest importance is understanding the integral, unified nature of reality and that we're not separate. And we do, we are empowered, we have meaning, we have purpose. It's very crucial that we show up at this time. As you say, we don't have the luxury of, of, of being able to go on acting irresponsibly, whether it's to each other, ourselves, or to our planet, because we're, we're in a point of global emergency. And unless we can transform that into emergence, I'm not sure there will be a, a viable planet for our grandchildren and their children to inherit and that would be a complete dereliction of any duty we have as humans and as parents and as microcosmic co-creators of our realities. Yeah, there's some lawsuit afoot in the United States where a certain group of rather young people are, are suing, I don't know whether they're suing the EPA or Exxon or somebody, but they're suing them for a, a sort of a dereliction of duty because Absolutely. they feel that the, you know these companies or entities are sowing the seeds for a very difficult life as as they become Absolutely. adults. Yeah. Absolutely, and you know one of the early endorsers of of my book, um, the Dr. Larry Dossi, basically said exactly this. You know the issues that I'm raising in the book could make the difference between whether, you know, uh, ours is a, a viable species yeah. in a generation or two generations going forward. Um, let's talk about that some more because um, a lot of the discussion we've had might seem a little cerebral to some people. We want to make sure that we're really getting down to the nitty gritty practicality of it. Absolutely. Um, but one thing I just want to throw in that might get you started on that is that um, what you're saying before about the hologram and how information is encoded in consciousness ultimately. Um, there's, a, there's a really cool verse in the Rig Veda which goes something like, Richo akshare parme vyoman yasmin deva adivishve nishe du, and it goes on. But what it's, and I just happen to know that particular verse, I'm not an expert in the Vedas, but um, what, what it's saying is that knowledge is the impulses of intelligence which are responsible for the manifestation and governance of the, of the universe reside in consciousness. 
and that he who does not know consciousness, know his own you know, inner nature, what can those impulses do for him? Um, but the, he who knows that, then those impulses are sort of at his, in his service. They, they support his life. You were talking before about synchronicities and how everything just go, went so amazingly well for you in you know, that tour and, and other things in your life, I'm sure. It's a, that's a practical example of you know, knowing this deeper reality and thereby um, enlisting the collaboration of the impulses of intelligence which are responsible for the governance of the universe. Yeah, ab absolutely right. And one of the things I write about later in the book are what I call uh, an octave of eight co-creative principles, which I've sort of gleaned from many, many different traditions, but in my own experience in life. And it is that when we become more aware, we become more attuned to that innate intelligence. And therefore, we, uh, when, we're, when we are open to this, we experience more and more synchronicities, which essentially are our way showers. For me, synchronicities are the way showers that I am in attunement with that, that highest flow. And it become, life becomes progressively effortless. And I don't mean it's not, it has its challenges, and I don't mean you know, we don't have to show up. But it's about showing up and getting out of the way, out of the, the way of the ego and flowing with this, this higher um, flow of, of the universe's evolutionary impulse and being with that. It's being rather like a, a surfer, you know, catching the wave and going with it rather than trying to fight it or second guess it or, you know. So there are, there are really practical, everyday principles of co-creativity that certainly my life have made a, an enormous difference to, to my well-being and my appreciation and my enjoyment of, of life. Yeah. Um, you know, we were talking about the holographic principle, holographic universe, and, the, and how the pixelization at the Planck scale. And um, would you, and this is a bit of a, a segue here, doesn't play off exactly what you were saying just now, but... Um, would you say that, um, and, and you in your book you quote Deepak Chopra, who was quoting Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, using the <laughs> using the phrase "field of all possibilities" to refer to that sort of unmanifest field of all knowledge or field of all all, all potentialities. And um, so, would you say that each of these pixels at the Planck scale has to be a field of all possibilities in and of itself or do pixels kind of specialize as they might on a computer screen where they're all different colors and they kind of collaborate with each other to produce certain manifestations in other words is, is the total knowledge contained in each point or are our points more specialized than that I would say the points are more specialized than that and I think we need to sort of take a step beyond that holographic boundary. What I'm describing as that holographic pixelated boundary of information is the pixelated boundary of what we call the physical realm. Yeah. So that pixelation at the Planck scale holding one digitized bit of information per Planck scale can hold a vast, vast, vast amount of information through the whole cycle of our universe. But it's the information that is manifested within what we call space-time. The possibilities, the multidimensionalities form different levels beyond that holographic membrane, as it were and yet are associated with it. So I'm going to be writing about that, which also plays very much into the Vedas, but also many other traditions to explore the, the multidimensionality of, of realities mm. in more depth in my, in my next books. But what I wanted to establish in the cosmic hologram was that as those possibilities cohere and converge and what they tend to do is form what's called attractor basins of, of uh, literally attracting a certain way of being so biological ecosystems are underpinned by attractor basins that's how biological evolution uh, progresses um, all complex systems are underpinned the entire universe is pinned by these attractors so 
attractors of love, attractors of fear, attractors of whatever. But when they are manifest in the physical realm, it's that manifestation that then adds to what perhaps the, the, the Hindu tradition of the Akashic field would be as the holographic boundary of what we call space time. But possibilities are playing out on many multidimensional levels. Mm. Multidimensional experiences and, and intelligence is playing out. The holographic boundary is what gets fed into what we call the physical realm, essentially. Mm. Would there be, yeah, I mean, obviously we understand that our, even in terms of the, the gross realm, uh, our human capacity for perception is very limited by, you know, we just a little sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum that which we see as visible sure. light and a little sliver of the total range of possible sounds and so on. Um, but, um, you know, then taking into account all the, the multidimensionality that you're referring to, all sorts of subtle realms that, that modern science doesn't even recognize exist. Um, are you saying that uh, each sort of I mean, you, you referred to the holographic thing in the physical realm, but it would seem to me that all realms and all strata of creation uh, would work by this principle of holography, if any of them do. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's just that when we're, when we're considering the physical realm, it is that, that particular boundary of what, you know, that is within what we call space-time and, and what we call energy matter, which is information expressed as space-time, information expressed as energy matter. It's what then is manifested in the physical realm that is the, the this pixelated at the Planck scale. Uh -huh. Well, the physical realm is just the one we're accustomed to functioning in, but that, sure. that doesn't give it any sort of superiority to other realms no, no, no. <laughs> that we don't function in, and perhaps those Good realms. Lord, no. No. <laughs> Good um, Lord, no, absolutely not. Yeah. I want to get pe I want to get people over the bridge from a materialistic, dualistic perspective to a multidimensional unified understanding of which our physical universe is an exquisite co-creative construction of consciousness. Here, here. Me too. That just, that just gets us over the bridge and then we can start the real adventure. Yeah, and that inspires me to, 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 to comment on the, the fact that I always have the feeling, I always just um, have this sort of awestruck notion that God is hiding in plain sight. And you were talking earlier about how much information is potentially encoded at the Planck scale. So, you know, many, many orders of magnitude beyond what we can encode through our crude technologies. But if you think about it, I mean, to take a little leaf or a single cell in a leaf, and there's so much information in that cell. It's such a marvelous, intricate, you know, yes. little, little thing. And then there are trillions of them in, in, in one entity and, and, yes. and so on and so on out, out throughout the whole universe. So just think. And then there's the whole karmic thing of how every, Indra's net, how everything is actually connected directly with everything else and influencing everything else. And I mean, it just boggles the mind. And so you think about the amount of information. I mean, even the way our eye sees the amount of information that's taken in compared to what a webcam or a camcorder or any kind of digital device can take in is minuscule. So, you know, the, the intelligence that is functioning in every bit of creation, every chunk of creation, every, you know, large and small, top to bottom, is just beyond comprehension. So h how much data that represents <laughs> is, you know, it's amazing to consider. I agree. I mean, there are some suggestions that it could be 10 to the 120. So that's one followed by 120 zeros, right. bits of information, which is pretty mind blowing of itself. And, you know, it, it is wonderful. I mean, that's one big on hard that, drive. That's one big. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, whatever you want to call it, whether you want to call it cosmic mind, cosmic intelligence, you know, it, it, literally, it, it, or God, you know, it is everything. It isn't, you know, it is, it is literally everything we call reality is God. Everything we call reality is cosmic mind. Yeah. Everything we call reality is consciousness at many, many different levels of experience and awareness playing out. A, a question came in from one of our viewers, uh, Matt in California. He asks, um, how do chakras and astral bodies uh, and, and individual consciousness 
fit into the holographic worldview? Thanks for the question, Matt, and it's a good one. I actually wrote a book called The Eighth Chakra, which was about the perception that as we expand our awareness beyond the, the personality of the seven main chakras, we're bridging to what I'm calling chakras, but there are really levels of awareness into an enlightenment where is a 12-fold level of awareness that eventually forms the 13th hole, which is Buddhic consciousness, Christ consciousness, etc. So given that everything we call reality is consciousness at play, then the chakric system has, if you like, a physicalized very, very low level energy associated with it, but it, it plays out beyond the level of the holographic boundary. So it fits into this perfectly, as does all the supernormal phenomena I was talking about earlier. So for me, they're not supernatural or paranormal, as Dean Radin has also pointed out. Um, they are supernormal attributes that are innate aspect of, of the, this, this model I'm calling the cosmic hologram. Yeah, and um, I, I suppose Dean would agree that when you say supernormal, you don't mean that it in, in any way violates any laws of nature. It's just not ordinary because it's not a, exactly. not a common experience, but you know, neither were airplanes you know, 200 years ago. We, we saw birds doing it, but you know, any kind of human flight was, would have been considered extraordinary. Now it's commonplace. Abs yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Dean, um, Dean Radin, uh, if people don't know, is uh, at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and he does a lot of research on psi phenomenon. Um, do you have any explanation for the, me the mechanism of psi phenomenon? Um, you know, and, and perhaps an elaboration on that question is how can we affect, you know, qu quantum or classical phenomenon? Um, and what are the prospects for a scientific theory in this area? Well, first of all, all laboratory experiments have shown that, um, you know, reality is not realized at the quantum scale, but much, much beyond that. Reality is not realized unless it's observed or measured in some way. And how we observe or measure in a laboratory uh, conditions uh, then guide whether that entity appears as a wave or a particle. So extending that, we, we've done experiments now to, to extend that reality to classical objects. And we've also shown that our universe, uh, which is innately non-local, which of course is, is what all these supernormal or psi phenomena are about. In other words, it transcends phenomena that transcend the, the limits of space and time. Within space and time, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And yet these phenomena and something called non-local connectivity does do that. Things can, can change, you know, if you create a twin set of particles, quantum particles, and separate them by a galaxy or the whole universe, you switch the attributes of one, the other will immediately switch. In other words, they're non-locally interconnected. No signal is going between them. That is the same for supernormal phenomena. And what that is showing, and by the way, something called Bell's theorem states that for quantum physics to work at all, our entire universe must be non-locally interconnected. So what we have is a universe that is unified and non-locally interconnected, and yet within what we call space-time, there is the signaling speed limit, which is the speed of light. So all the psi phenomena that, that Dean is studying, what I call supernormal phenomena, I write about in the book, is, is a, a natural attribute of, of our universe as a cosmic hologram. Yeah, so I think you're suggesting that there is a foundational reality or substratum that is not constrained by time and space that transcends those and th through which information can be mediated or can be can be transmitted yeah. and that, that would explain quantum entanglement and stuff like that. That's right, but very importantly, those perceptions are non-entropic. In other words, they, they don't dislocate.
Yeah. So you need. Uh, you, so it's the old. You need both. Yeah, both. Um, you need both. It's the old boundaries and boundless thing. Um, exactly. I was, just, I was just listening to a talk by a friend, and and she was talking about um, the the value of sort of transcending boundaries and just being unbounded and not being specific, and that has its value. But if you need to land a, a jumbo jet in a snowstorm or perform brain surgery, you also you also want the specificity. Yeah. And, and the exactly. trick the trick is to have both simultaneously. Both. It's, it's, it definitely is the and and. It's, it's what you were saying earlier, what we were talking about earlier in terms of the numinosity and the transcendence, and yet being, you know, communicating with, learning from, exploring with at many, many different levels of awareness. Yeah. So now a minute ago you said something about, um, I forget how you phrased it, but are, are you one of these people who, who would say that the moon doesn't exist unless someone perceives it, or do you, don't, you don't go there? I do go there actually, and I don't use the point of the moon, but I do use the, 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 the idea of a tree falls in a distant forest and nobody sees it. And what I'm saying is when you understand that it's enti our entire universe is observing itself, Okay, that, that helps to resolve that argument. I think it was Einstein and Tagore that had an argument over that, and Tagore was saying the moon doesn't exist unless you observe it, and Einstein was saying it does. And, and, uh, but you know, then, you have to, then it gets kind of absurd, like, okay, if everybody in the world agreed not to look at the moon, would there still be tides, you know, and <laughs> things like that. But, um, but it's, a very, it's a very egoistic approach to consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm not seeing it, it doesn't exist. Think of the whole universe, literally, as a universe soul observing itself. Right, and it took quite a few billion years before there could be life forms capable of observing anything, but meanwhile the universe had to evolve. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now this thing you're talking about, the universe observing itself, is very interesting, because there are some who, who, who kind of like um, outline the mechanics of manifestation in terms of that very thing. They say consciousness, well, actually I should reference Maharishi, he, he, he talked about this at great length, but that consciousness being conscious observes itself. It can't help but do so because it's by nature has to observe something, but if there's nothing around for it to observe, it observes itself. But in so doing, it sets up a, a trilogy, as it were, between observer, observed, and processes of observation. Uh, and that begins to bifurcate and symmetry break into more and more and more complexity, which gives rise to the whole manifest universe. Um, and he also talked about how, you know, on the other hand, how could that be happening because it's only consciousness and so how could there be this, this diversification? And so there's this infinite frequency that gets set up between the one and the many and that infinite frequency is like this hum at the foundation of creation. Uh, which has sort of infinite potency or potentiality within it. And uh, anyway, he, he explained it much more eloquently than that, but I, I thought you might find that interesting. I find it very interesting and it's very complimentary to, to what you know I'm saying in the book essentially. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> and and, and yeah, what I love is what he's saying and what the, the ancient perception, certainly the Vedas taught, you know, is, is, is very, you know, um, coherent, very complementary with what leading edge science is pointing at, which is why, you know, the whole point of this is to reconcile science and, and spiritual perspectives. And within the unified reality that consciousness is the whole world. Yeah. Here's a couple of interesting points from our friend Robin, who who um, would like to have a conversation with you later when you get, when you get a chance. But um, I'd like that. Yeah, you might have glanced at the points he he sent me. But I um, did. Yeah, there's some interesting things in here. For instance, you speak of uh, reality as being fundamentally simple, and he brought up the objection. Well, yeah, but quantum field theory and unified field theory are not simple. The physiology is not simple. The course of action you know, all the karmic ramifications of anything don't seem to be simple. But I think what you're getting at is that if you kind of, the, the deeper you go, the simpler it gets. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. and f ultimately, fundamentally, the universe is simple. It gets more complex as it diversifies. Absolutely. I mean, Einstein said our un the universe is as simple as it can be, but no simpler. Yeah. 
So what I was doing in the first sort of seven or eight chapters is, is to actually showing that level of simplicity. But it, what's so beautiful is, for example, if you look at, at networks, complicated networks, the appearance of complication, when you, when you pull it down, there are three aspects of a network that matter uh, of their individual units, which is shape, size and stickiness. Three things. And depending on the shape of a unit, if it's triangular or circular or whatever, depending on its size and depending on its stickiness, its relationship to the other parts of the network, an incredible level of complexity can evolve. But when you when you distill things down, they are literally as simple as they can be, but no simpler. And that's why you get things like universal classes. You look at the sort of fractals that um, play out in coastlines are the same fractals that play out, you know, through a myriad of, of, of the phenomena. The phenomena themselves manifest in what appears to be very, very different ways, very diverse ways. But the rules, the underlying rules are as simple as they can be, but no simpler. And when you understand it from an algorithmic and an informational sense, you begin to understand why that is the case. And the absolute exquisiteness of, of that playing out throughout the whole of, of physical reality. So would a good example of that be, for instance, if you throw a ball, there are an infinite number of trajectories that ball could take, but it takes the path of least action. It takes the most efficient possible trajectory. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that plays out in, in quantum physics as well. It doesn't just play. The universe is, is essentially lazy. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but it's the least <laughs> effort. It's the least resistance. It's the least effort. Yeah, you know? well, God did take Sunday off, right? Thank he could have kept working. Thank goodness he did. He could have <laughs> kept working, but he didn't. Um, I think that this simplicity point has relevance to spiritual seekers in that, mm -hmm. you know, some people give, some people have this objection to spiritual practices because they feel like you're doing something and that's only going to... Uh, reinforce the notion of a doer. It's going to reinforce your individuality. But I think that there could be a kind of a criterion for spiritual practice that f adheres to the law of least effort and that if a practice were really natural and effortless then you really aren't doing anything even though you might be sitting down to apparently do something but you're kind of um, surrendering to natural processes which conduct the whole thing for you and so that without any inception of effort uh, or in any inefficiency, uh, the goal is achieved. The goal being maybe transcendence or whatever the nature of the practice is meant to, to achieve. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, when I talk about effortlessness, it's when we talk about effort, it's usually there's a resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, spiritual practice or, or you know, how we live our lives, by going with the flow, you, sh you show up, you know, it's not about sitting on a mountain and doing nothing. You're showing up in whatever's calling you to show up. But then you, you try and get your ego out of the way so that you really can enter into that flow. And yeah. I was with a group of friends You don't, you don't even week. try to get your ego out of the way because that would be an effort. You, you Absolutely. <laughs> it could be simpler you, than that. Yeah, and that's the spiritual path, isn't it? So you do get to a point in your own journey where you realize that your ego is, is counterproductive and you don't become ego-less, you become ego-free, mm. which enables that flow to happen. I was talking with a group of friends. Um, I'm a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle and we're up at um, Alex, Alex and Alison Gray's place, Cosm, last week. And one of the things we were discussing was, was what's happening in the world and the showing up and the effortlessness. And we kept a perspective of, of, of perceiving life and perceiving um, as, a, as a river. And sometimes that river is flowing very fast and sometimes it's flowing very slowly. And the point is to, when you enter that river, you go with the speed of the river. So you show up on the river and you don't try and swim faster than the river. You mm -hmm. don't try and hold yourself back from the river. You go with the flow of the river, which mm -hmm. is the least effort that you could mm -hmm bring into the situation yeah row 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 your boat gently down the stream you know you're you're rowing <laughs> but you're letting the stream do the work you're just sort of like having this subtle intention to you know not go off into some eddy or get stuck in the banks or whatever <laughs> absolutely and, and, and you know if you look how trout and how salmon uh, jump up the river mm -hmm. they have an amazing ability to do that they're aerodynamically or, or water dynamically uh, optimum efficiency to do that and they understand the flow 
they're so, so naturally just understand that flow and that enables them to leap these great heights to make their way up the river. Mm -hmm. um, you refer in your book to our perfect universe. Um, why perfect? Some people would look at it and say, oh, there's all these mistakes and diseases and, and sufferings and, you know, asteroids wiping out populated planets and, and so on. How, how can you see it as perfect? Well, I wanted to, <laughs> I was actually being quite facetious in one sense, mm -hmm. in the sense that I love chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. I love chocolate cake. And my mum used to bake the most perfect chocolate cake. So what I, I looked at to begin with in the book, I wanted to, to see how our universe baked its own cake. You know, what were the instructions, what were the ingredients, what was the, the, the recipe, what was the, um, what was the container. So literally to treat our universe as existence and, and evolution as, as essentially baking its own perfect chocolate cake. And for me, the definition of perfect is that after 13.8 billion years of its existence and evolution, mm -hmm. My mum could bake the most beautiful chocolate cake that when I was a little girl, I used to, I could not have enough of. So that's my definition of perfect, that it essentially enables, um, enables us to, um, to exist hmm. as, as a biological species. So you, are you saying that the whole purpose of the universe was to produce your mom who could produce chocolate cakes? No, but perhaps to actually produce um, self-aware beings <laughs> such as ourselves. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? I also think we could talk about it, you know, I mean, it takes something that is, that we don't like, like, let's say an, a disease, an epidemic or something, um, you know, look closely at what's actually happening there as much as we don't like it on our human level. Uh, if you look closely at the mechanisms of it, there is vast, almost incomprehensible intelligence functioning in those little viruses or whatever is, is involved Absolutely. there. Absolutely. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, is God making a mistake with that? Or is that just part of the polarities that are ne necessary in a relative world? If you're going to have hot, you have to have cold. If you're healthy, if you, you're going to have to have the sick and so on. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I would agree with you completely that this is polarities playing out. We, we play, we, you know, our perspective is from a very human centric viewpoint, but the viruses, um, which actually more and more are being seen as, as the guiders, the wave guides of, of evolutionary progress mm. are key. If they didn't exist, you know, and, and what they do is they, they not just mutate into evolutionary progress, but they also cull so that where there's a weakness in a species to, to enable overall an optimization within an ecosystem. You could argue, yes, the, an asteroid um, destroyed the, um, killed off the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Before that, there was a series of extinction events. But as I write about in the book, that spurred on uh, uh, evolution. Because what happens is going back to, to the universe being lazy, in, for example, the last 12,000 years of the Holocene era, which has been environmentally very stable, there's been very little biological evolution. There's been obviously cultural evolution, but very little biological evolution. Is that the era we're because in now? That's the era we're in now, except okay. that we're now entering into what is being called the Anthropocene era or the Anthropocene era, um, which is our human driven uh, extinction right. uh, of other species, extinction, yeah. sixth great extinction. But the point is on each of those preceding extinctions, because the environment changed so much, instead of no speciation, no new species or, or gradual new species, there was a, a vast spurring on at the end of um, 66 million years ago when the asteroid uh, cause the demise of not just the dinosaurs, but many other species, a tiny little shrew, mouse-like uh, uh, organism, then start, um, the first mammals kick-started their revolution to us. So with this extinction, and we may cause our own extinction through it, then it suggests to me that there could equally be a, a spur of different 
biological expressions on our planet. So it's not about saving the planet, it's ultimately about saving ourselves. To be very selfish, and that isn't my perspective, but you know, that is what we're likely to do uh, unless we change course. Yeah, and we shouldn't use the fact that life flourished after the last extinction and other extinctions as an excuse for um, fostering not. a new extinction because we're talking about extinguishing it's ourselves. And even though life may flourish after we're gone, um, it's going to take a while for it to get back to you know where it is now. And it might be better to try to avert the danger which has not yet come, to quote Patanjali, and uh, you know, Absolutely. turn it around. Yeah. And as my friend Irvin Laszlo said, you know, we're the first generation to both have the ability to destroy life on Earth, but also the ability to consciously evolve. You know, we have this amazing bi point of bifurcation, it seems to me at the moment. Um, either we break down or we break through. Yeah. Some uh, compare us to teenagers, you know, who've kind of grown out of the dependence on the parents and gotten into this sort of free will stage where we can make choices and we can be very destructive in our choices or constructive and can go either way and hopefully we make it through adolescence into adulthood. <laughs> Absolutely. I talk about as it's time for us to grow up, you know, it's enough of gurus and it's enough of teenage rebellion and angst, it's time for us to grow up. Yeah. It's interesting that the Hindus speak of, you know, they have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the creator, the maintainer, and the destroyer, and they, they consider destruction to be as, part, as much a part of the whole show as creation. Exactly. And that goes back to your point about, you know, about God and, and uh, polarities. You know, every wave has a beginning, a, a, a peaking and a falling away. And evolution plays out in those waves. All creation, you know, the ancient tradition, uh, of the uh, Ida, the Pingala, the Shashumna, going back to Matt's question about the about the chakras mm -hmm. and the and, and the meridians, um, this threefold, this trinitized, um, you know, manifestation plays out throughout our entire universe. Whether it's the levels of of sort of energy meridians in a human body, whether it's you know atoms having positive, negative, neutral elements to them, mm. uh, whether it's the it's the uh, the, the, the Vedic tradition of the, the, the creator, the maintainer, and the destroyer, playing out at all scales. Yeah. Well, we have about five minutes left. Um, is there anything really important that we haven't covered? I'm sure, I feel like, you know, coming to a vast smorgasbord with a little teacup plate, you know, when I'm talking to you, there's so much we could cover. Um, but, um, you know, hopefully we will have given people a, a taste and um, they'll sign up for the rest of the smorgasbord with a bigger plate. But um, is there anything that um, you know you really want to get in here before we close? Perhaps something of a um, predictive nature. You know, do you have any? Do you, are you optimistic for the future? Or do you feel like you you see trends and tendencies in our world to be you know leading us in a in a hopeful direction? Well, I think what's important is when a complex system is 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 unable to sustain itself. What what happens in a complex system? is it's, under, it's underlain by these attractor basins that are non-physical, but they act as the boundaries within which that system can operate. And when a system is unable to sustain those boundaries, it, it starts to, to fall away, it starts to break down. Mm. But sometimes what happens is that there's another attractor system starting to crystallize at a higher level of coherence. So you have the old, as it were, the old paradigm going on to the Thomas Kuhn and, and progression by funerals. You have an old system that's, that's about to, you know, it's breaking down, but you have this new possibility, a more coherent possibility beginning to crystallize. And what happens is that the two systems are at that non-physicalized underpinning level coexist but the old system has a deeper rut to it, but it's falling away. The, the new possibility isn't yet fully manifest. And what happens, the two jump between, and it's called flickering. Mm. So if we have a sense that our global society, our human collective psyche is at a point in its possibility that the old paradigm, the old dualistic perspectives that have driven our dysfunctional behaviors can't hold anymore. 
yeah and yet more and more people are starting to appreciate that we are all interconnected that we do matter that we can come together to look after and care for each other then that is what is crystallizing at this higher level of coherence and it's almost as though when we look at world events we're flickering between the two on the one, we have a lot of negativity, a lot of fear, a lot of, of, of distraction, a lot of pain. On the other hand, we have a lot of hope, a lot of positivity, a lot of potentiality. And so for me, this is the breakdown, this is the breakthrough. So every single person that shows up and says, I want to be in that attractor. I want to start to, you know, whatever, however small it is, what I can do, what I can do can make a difference and does make a difference, however small. And this is nonlinear, a tiny chain, you know, a tiny cause can have a major effect. So if I show up, that can be the tipping point. I can be that person who tips that into reality. I can be that person who makes a small change, you know, that my contribution, however small, can be the tipping point. And that's what I'd like to say to people. Everyone matters. Everyone can make a choice in this regard. Are you part of the problem or are you part of a solution? Are you part of the old dying song or are you part of a, an inspiring, empowering, new and better song? Mm. Was it you who was quoting Desmond Tutu as saying that if you think you're too small to make a difference, try spending a night with a mosquito in your room? I said that in an earlier book. I didn't say it in this one. But <laughs> I yeah. heard it in one of your talks. <laughs> it's, 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 but it's, it's so true, isn't it? Yeah. It's just so true. Yeah. yeah, very true. Well, that's a good note to end on. I mean, it's an optimistic note. Um, you know, I think that and I mean, one way of elaborating on it is to say that if you can work at more causal or fundamental levels, you have a bigger impact than would than you might expect. Uh, you know, the, the molecular is more powerful than, than the mechanical, the atomic is more powerful than the molecular, and there's something very fundamental or, or causal about the, the, the deeper spiritual levels of experience that we are unfolding, and I think that the impact of everyone who you know, unfolds that in their experience is uh, much larger than they may realize or than may be obvious in, in any superficial way. Absolutely agree. And, and to really understand that, you know, the message of the cosmic hologram is that everyone can make a difference. We are all microcosmic co-creators of our realities and we are all fundamentally interconnected as part of a unified and coherent and intelligent universe. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Jude. I really enjoyed the, the two hours have flown by. And um, I ho hope to speak with you again in the future. Um, I'll be linking to Jude's website from her page on batgap.com, as I always do, and links to her books and so on. And uh, have you got anything coming up that people can actually participate in or should they just read your books or whatever? <laughs> What I'm doing at the moment, I'm doing a lot of interviews, uh, which are lovely, and I've thoroughly enjoyed this, Rick, so thank you so, so much. But obviously, I'll, I'll post this onto my website, and mm -hmm. any events that I'm doing, and any interviews or articles that I'm writing, all of that will go up on the website. Okay, great. And uh, you have some kind of mailing list people can sign up for there? Yeah, they can sign up. Folks can sign up for my free uh, uh, newsletter. It's it's sporadic at the moment because I'm so busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm hoping to get a I'm hoping to get a, a newsletter out in the next few weeks. Um, but keep people if, if people can visit the reg, the website. We also uh, have a Facebook page uh, for the whole world view, and we also have a YouTube channel for the whole world view. Both of those of which um, are posted to the to the web. Good, great. Well, thanks so much, and thanks to your husband Tony for his help. <laughs> and um, we'll be speaking again. So to those who've been listening or watching, uh, thank you for doing so. This is an ongoing series, uh, as you probably know. Um, go to batgap.com and explore the menus and you'll see all sorts of things, all the past interviews, list of upcoming interviews, place to be notified by email of, of new interviews, um, audio podcast sign up and so on. So just check out the menus. It's all pretty, pretty obvious and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Rick. Thank you, Jude.